All right, Billy, let's advance ourselves to asthmatic kids. Let's talk about this article on treating severe asthma in kids. So this is sort of a review of the evidence uh, up to date, and it's um, the subtitle is Improving Management of Severe Asthma, BiPAP and Beyond. And we're talking about the pediatric population. This is in Clinical Pediatric Emergency Medicine. It's a 2018 paper. Uh, it's uh, preceded by all of the normal preamble stuff, which is that asthma is a common problem. And just to add some numbers to it, 6.2 million children have asthma in the United States, 8.4% of the population. It's a super common ED presentation, 600,000 ED um, presentations. And some of them are scary as hell. So the hyperacute crashing asthmatic when they're kids, um, there are deaths in that group, hundreds of deaths, a couple hundred a year. And those deaths from asthma overall were increasing. And some 15 years ago, 20 years ago, this resulted in the National Airway, a National Asthma Education um, and um, uh, Prevention Program, which first came out in 1989, which really focused on what's the relationship between these kids and their ED presentations and the rest of their care and tried to sort of get people on board with standardizing their care. And that's made reference to in multiple places in this particular manuscript as well. When an asthmatic comes to the emergency room, there are three main treatment goals. One is to correct hypoxia. Two is to re reverse their airflow obstruction as rapidly as you can and reduce the likelihood of relapse and reduce the likelihood of hospitalization as well, I would add. Basic treatment includes inhaled oxygen, systemic corticosteroids, inhaled beta agonists, and inhaled ipratropium. And I think that would be no surprise to anyone. <coughs> In terms of corticosteroids, I sometimes see people who have been seen at another ER and referred to ours and, other, and they've never received steroids. They've just stayed with the um, beta adrenergic inhaled agents and steroids are really in indicated for all patients who come to the emergency room with an ex asthma exacerbation. I'm always telling the residents, you need to give me a really good reason why you wouldn't do it. Um, there's um, synergistic uh, with um, the um, beta agonists. They decrease airway inflammation. Remember, there's two components to this disease. There's the inflammation and then the bronchoconstriction. Early administration is important to treatment. So as I say, you don't want to delay with these and delay increases likelihood of admission in several uh, prospective trials. Um, like everywhere else, though, it doesn't really matter which route you go. Oral or IV are equally effective. Guidelines currently recommend the oral route. But I'll just say this. The guidelines don't really focus on the emergency setting. So if you've got a kid who's in distress and the idea that you're going to give them something oral that tastes like crap and make them cough, I'm not going there if I don't have to. I'll probably go IV in that particular setting. Um, in terms of whether you should be at two milligrams per kilogram or one milligram per kilogram, again, lots and lots of studies have looked at this. And it turns out you don't get any benefit by going to the higher end of the dose range. Uh, doses over two milligrams per kilogram are not more effective, and they're not recommended even in severe cases because they just bring um, side effects to bear. So there's no point in pushing them, but you should give them and you should give them early. Dosing, and they go through here, oral dosing, IV dosing, and talk about discharge management. You can see them all here on the slide in terms of what they're recommending. And you can see that if you're talking about prednisone, there's no point in pushing to two. You can go one milligram per kilogram. If you're going IV, you can go straight up with two milligrams per kilogram of methylprednisone max of 125, and um, discharging them. Um, you can either give a second dose of dexamethasone because it lasts sort of, you know, 48, 72 hours, um, um, or you can complete a five-day course of PO prednisone or whatever equivalent steroid you want to use. In terms of uh, inhaled beta-2 agonists, you're going to go after them with short-acting beta agonists, which is first line. They're going to promote bronchoconstriction. The dose in children um, uh, under age 12, less than 35 kilograms, is going to be 0.15 to 0.3 mg per kg, up to 10 milligrams every one to four hours. And if they're sicker, you're going to go continuously. In terms of ipratropium, it's an acetylcholine receptor agonist, and this has been looked at 
you know, does it add something on top of the uh, bait agents? And the answer in every time it's been looked at is yes. It will decrease bronchoconstriction in an additive way. Recommended in severe exacerbations. Give it along with your short-acting beta agonist. Um, but don't use it as a sole agent. Use it on top of the short-acting betas. Improves lung function. Decreases hospital admissions, particularly in the severe um, exacerbations. Dose, 0.25 to 0.5 every 20 minutes times three, and then every six hours as needed. Um, severe asthma treatment, continuous beta agonists. Certainly if you're seeing a sick kid or, or they're not responding, then you want to up the ante here. What are the side effects of giving continuous beta agonists and increasing that uh, route of administration? is hypokalemia, dysrhythmias, tremors, diastolic hypotension. Truthfully, I, I think these are not very common or of huge concern. They're noted. At very high doses, you might see lactic acidosis. And in these kinds of kids, usually have a line in, and I'm usually giving fluids as well. Um, they may have increased tachypnea if their acidosis is severe, so that's a little bit of a problem. Uh, but I think overcoming their bronchoconstriction is still... The most important thing. And if you're going with continuous beta 2 agonists, they recommend continuous monitoring. I think that would be happening in most any setting where that was happening. And what are the doses if you're going to go continuous for children up to the age of 12? It's 0.15 to 0.3 mg per kg up to 10, or 0.5 mg per kg per hour continuous. And I frequently write for these back to back to back or continuous uh, when I'm faced with a child who's um, pulling hard and, and looking sick. What about magnesium sulfate? I was happy to see that they uh, went for it here. They say it enhances bronco relaxation. It's as a smooth rustle relaxer. Recommended in children with severe exacerbations, not responding to usual therapy, and that indeed is where I would use it. They note that it also contributes to decreased hospital admission rates. Side effects, I think they depend a lot on your rate of administration, but are vasodilatation and hypotension. And they say consider uh, current IV isotonic fluids, and I'm all for that. And the dose uh, is a pretty broad range that's listed out there, 25 to 75 milligrams per kilogram dose over 20 minutes, or even, I, I'm going to add my own editorial here, or even over 30 or 40 minutes. And I tend to like the higher dose range. Again, if this is a sicker kid, because I don't do this on all kids, it's recommended in children with severe exacerbations that aren't responding. I like to go towards the upper end here, and I might stretch it out over a little more time. Just not what they wrote, but what I editorialize on this. In terms of severe asthma treatment with epinephrine or terbutaline, these agents may shorten recovery time. With regards to epinephrine, um, uh, I am dosing works rapidly, and uh, they say that you should go that route if you are. Use it for severe life-threatening cases, cases where the nebulizer is not uh, tolerated or where you're suspecting that you're getting into a bad place with it. Or if you're worried about anaphylaxis or allergy as a cause, you really want to make sure you don't skip the epi because then it moves to the head of the line in terms of their treatments and not as an add-on. Terbutaline, a uh, selective beta-2 agonist, you can give it sub-Q, or IV. I have to say I can't remember the last time I gave terbutaline IV, but I do give um, epinephrine IV when I need to um, in the crashing asthmatic. But here they say you might do it uh, IV as well. Terbutaline dosing for sub-Q is 0.01 mg per kg, max 0.25. Every 20 minutes up to uh, times three is needed. And if you're going to go IV with it, it's 0.1 to 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute continuous in normal saline or dextrose. And you're going to titrate it to effect if you're going IV. Um, again, these are really in the sicker kids that are, are going to be admitted. High flow nasal cannula studies suggest benefit, but we need more, and particularly in peds, um, we need more. Uh, can consider in severe cases before using non-invasive ventilation or intubation. Um, the mechanism is it washes out dead space, provides some positive airway pressure, reduces work of breathing. All sounds like should be good stuff. But recognize that if you're in this place where you're using it, you got to be watching the kid like a hawk because you still may need to go on to advanced airway management. 
In terms of non-invasive ventilation with positive pressure support, very inter various interfaces and modes, um, the optimal patient for it is awake, cooperative, and able to tolerate the intervention. You know, if a kid's really panicky and uncooperative, you might not be able to do this. When you want to do it, uh, when it looks like work or breathing is a significant problem and the child's fatiguing, when they appear to, or you have blood gas data or VBG data indicating that they have hypercapnia um, or hypoxemia, when shouldn't you use it, uh, non-invasive ventilation, if they're hypoventilating, altered mental status, or not protecting the airway, and pretty clearly in respiratory and cardiac arrest. This depends a lot for me on how cooperative and capable the kid is of you know, receiving cheerleading and helping them do it. If they're old enough and able to sort of understand and get with the program and not terrified by it, I'm all in favor of it. In terms of BiPAP, which is usually where I'm headed if I'm going with non-invasive ventilation, you can separate the inspiratory and expiratory uh, support. Definitely decreases workload. Uh, data in severe asthma is limited, um, and the recent review in PEDS shows no strong positive or negative data. Obviously, if you're going to use it, you want to closely monitor them. What are the recommended settings? Again, just like everything else in asthma, you're going to be using lower tidal volumes, 5 to 7 mill uh, milliliters per kilogram. Uh, your goal pulse ox is 90% or greater, and you can separate out their IPAP and EPAP. You can start at 10 and 5, but they recommend not going higher than uh, 20 to 25 over 10 to 15. Um, I've certainly been in those ranges of, um, of IPAPs where you might be up in the 20 to 25 range. And if you look at uh, European and some South American literature, they frequently go up to those ranges, but it's usually older kids or young adults. And they may need sedation. Consider ketamine or dexmedetomidate, uh, they say, dex uh, dexmedetomidine infusion, if you have that available in your emergency department. We do at Stony Brook. I'm still not that familiar with it. And I would go to ketamine here uh, because it supposedly has its own bronchotilitation effect. You do have to be aware if you're using ketamine about the um, secretion increase and they need really good pulmonary toilet if you're going to go for ketamine, so you got to consider that. Um, heliox, combination of helium and oxygen, lower density, it's supposed to have better laminar flow, might improve or decrease the work of breathing and facilitate gas exchange. There's no other treatment effects, so you got to continue all your other therapies. You might use it as a bridge. Studies show variable efficacy in children. My own experience using it in adults is that it doesn't seem to do that much. So, again, just me editorializing on the side. I haven't been a huge fan of Heliox. I personally have never used it on a child, um, but um, they say that you can go, go that way if you want. The guideline recommends Heliox plus inhaled beta agonists, and you can power the inhalers um, with it, and so it works fine. They note that this is based on a single study with improved symptoms and decreasing length of say, you're going to use 70-30 helium to oxygen. It's important to note that if the kid needs a high FiO2 of greater than 30, you might encounter falling sats with this. And that if you um, don't have enough helium in there, here they're saying 70-30, you need the helium's a lighter gas and you need it. The whole benefit of this comes from the helium being a lighter gas with more laminar flow and less work of breathing. And you don't get that effect if you fall much below 70. So 70-30 is really where you are with using it if you're going to choose it. A few words about ketamine. It's supposed to be intri <coughs> intrinsically uh, bronchodilatory, uh, and so that's good. Pediatric guidelines either do not address or do not re recommend its use in severe asthma. I've had a couple of kids where I personally have done it, where it obviated the need for intubation and other things. And it was really in, a, in kids where there was a lot of panic involved in them and a lot of uh, sort of um, non-compliance with what we were trying to do because of that panic. And the ketamine just made it easier to manage. All their other treatments were much more successful. And so I'm okay with trying ketamine here. You have to be familiar with it. Um, but uh, the um, current guidelines for PEDS either do not address it or do not recommend it. Most data is case reports, and one RCT showed no benefit in ED patients. And I wouldn't expect it to show 
tremendous benefit. It's just about giving their other meds. It's not like the ketamine alone is curing them of this problem. But there you go. I'm editorializing some more. Um, severe asthma treatment, aminophilin. Uh, so, you know, the, the old methylxanthine approach, phosphodiesterase inhibitor. We used to do this all the time, and there were all these formulas for how to get the levels right and, and drug interactions that you had to be aware of, particularly in adults. Documented benefit in asthma is limited. Um, when added to usual therapy, it doesn't seem to uh, help, and it's currently not recommended. Um, in my opinion, it took uh, aminophilin to die a way too long of an ignominious death in this context, uh, but it did, in my opinion, eventually die, and the authors here agree, not recommended. Uh, inhaled anesthetics like isoflurane, sevoflurane, um, which are potential uh, bronchodilators, Never done it. I know that they do this occasionally when they're facing status asthmaticus with problemat uh, problematic vent settings and things in the ICU. Um, I've never done it. May not affect mortality, but seems to decrease length of stay and time on ventilators in some settings. Further research is needed. Um, this part of it I don't think is that relevant because if you're going to use those things, you need to have scavenger hoods and all that other stuff. All right, let's summarize. Usual therapy, we're all very familiar with it. Inhaled short-acting beta agonists. Corticosteroids, PO, equally effective to IV. Ipratropium. It's not either or, it's all of it. Severe cases get the usual therapy, but then you consider adding all of the other elements of the, chicken, of the kitchen sink. Con continuous nebulized sabas, epinephrine or terbutaline. Epinephrine, particularly if there's an allergic component, if it's, you know, animal dander, if you really think there's a trigger and there's an allergic component, then you really want the epi. IV magnesium, high-flow nasal cannula 2, non-invasive ventilation BiPAP, Heliox, ketamine plus minus, and then inhaled anesthetics. And that's sort of the full menu. And I think it's worth knowing what the full menu is so that as, as if you have a kid who's not doing well, you start recruiting other measures and for, you know, I, I'm spoiled. I work in a university environment for almost my entire career. And in that university environment, these kids are getting pick you people coming down and have pediatricians at the bedside. And so life is easy. I don't have to get that involved. But I've worked plenty of time in community hospitals where I would say that among the kids that I had to transfer from a community ED to a ped specialty center with ICU, among them, status asthmaticus is, you know, right up there. And that might represent or say something about the air quality in Los Angeles and some other issues. Uh, but uh, for me, uh, in my experience in community hospitals, this is one of the more important reasons that you might need to transfer. And that means that you have to manage them for a while, so it's worth knowing the full menu. So I like this review because of that. Um, when would you use aminophilin? Uh, probably not recommended. No. There you go. What do you got to say yeah, on that, Diane? I, you, I know you've worked some in the community as well. Um, yeah. So, and... you know, it's, it's a, this article, I was a little bit disappointed. It's, it, it doesn't really add to the practice so f that I do already. I was a little, I was kind of hoping it would have some of the little bit more cutting edge stuff or a little more, because there's some data on ketamine. There's, uh, I was hoping for a little bit more meat to this that and maybe it's just because asthma hasn't changed that much for a really long time well i think it's the because yeah. the peds literature it doesn't have it so there's a lot right. of that more because obviously it's one of the things i often say about asthma is there's reverse spectrum disease spectrum of disease bias in, in other words the sickest of asthmatic kids who would benefit from a magnesium bridge or a ketamine bridge or a heliox bridge if any of those bridges are really good those kids aren't studied you can't consent them Right. So it, so sure. so that we instead, a lot of times when you read asthma literature, what they describe in their paper is severe asthma. When you read what they're calling severe asthma, you're like, that's ho-hum asthma, um, not severe. That's true. Um, and the, the, the kids of the most interest are these hyper-acute, not the ones who've been getting sick over days, but the ones who've been sick for two hours and now look like they're going to try and die on you. Those are the scariest cases. And it's also the cases where you want to know the most about, is IV epi helpful? Is, right. is ketamine helpful as a bridge? You know, what are, you know, and so a lot of the questions that we want answered about these kids in their emergency department presentations are just, not only have they not been studied, but the very cases we're most interested 
can't be studied because you you can't start a consent process or a trial um, on that kind of. How, how do you consent a parent in that setting? True. Too That's much distress. True. So they're, yeah. they're not in there. So it's a nice, so this article is a nice sort of summary if you want it all in place. And, and what is nice in this article, the references are pretty great. Um, and going to the website the, is wonderful. So the, the, it does have a nice reference sort of resource for you as well. The other thing that I thought wasn't covered that well is, you know, what happens when you do intubate these kids? Yeah. Um, so they, there was not that much... Um, Kind of, t and I think that's really important for every emergency physician to know, which is asthma is a disease where the primary problem is you can't exhale. So hooking them to a machine to make them inhale more is really inviting barotrauma, pneumothorax, and a whole hypotension, uh, hypotension, right. a whole variety of things to the table. And while this article did not address any of those things, I think knowledge of all of those things and what to deal with are really important parts of emergency care when you see a kid that's so sick that they need to be intubated. And the other, the other thing they didn't deal with at all are some of the other sort of things about, you know, manual exhalation and some of those other things, you know, recruit, al basically alveolar recruitment tools that you might employ bef before you go to intubation, because intubation is a, is a last ditch move in these, and many of these kids get worse after intubated. I mean, it's, right. you know, that's, and it is, the, and it, that's it was, the downward it was a spiral. Pediatric emergency medicine publication, and it was on severe asthma, and it is kind of a big gap not to have anything about intubation and what then in this article. And even, the, and even the recruitment tools that you might use. And, and also not specifically dealing with the panic component, because um, some of these kids who, particularly the acute severe crashing ones, have a major component of panic that is part of the flail to this. And it's, I, I'm not saying it's not appropriate. I'd panic if I thought I couldn't breathe and was dying too. Right. Um, and I think the ketamine in some of those kids where suddenly now you, they can comply with their short acting betas and other things are happening, you don't need to intubate them. They got ketamine, but not as part of ketamine for intubation. They got ketamine and didn't need it. 